Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me once again is my partner, Pervez Ahmed. Welcome, everyone. Uh, good to be back. It's a um, it's, it's, uh, really exciting uh, time of year where we um, have lots of going, lo- lots of goings, going on, uh, not only uh, here at the show, but also just, um, you know, obviously things that we can kind of talk about and discuss. And uh, we've gotten some great feedback about our last couple episodes, so we were always grateful to hear um uh, the kind of feedback that people provide us, good and bad, right? <laughs> and um, yeah, we, you know, it's it's been it's been a good, it's been really good. So we're really excited about uh, the kind of shows that we would hope to bring in the next upcoming episodes. So I I think our guest uh, for this episode uh, could not be be better timed. We're joined this time by Hakeem Archuleta, and he has worked within the healing arts profession for over 30 years. His interest in medicine and natural health and the study of God's creation began as a child. Today, he lectures and teaches classes and workshops nationally. He's conducted workshops and lectured at University of California, Berkeley, Harvard, Wellesley, Stanford, UCLA, University of Houston, and many others. He addressed and led the New Mexico State Congress and opening prayers after 9-11, writes, reads, and organizes poetry readings. He has students and patients across the world. And I just want to point out, one of his students is my sister-in-law, my brother's wife, who uh, uh, certainly... uh, has has put to use his uh, concept of of holistically uh, uh, dieting and 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 the works and uh, I personally can vouch for how my life has benefited uh, from the work that he has done. Uh, Hakeem Archuleta, thank you so much for joining us on Diffuse Congruence. Yeah, well, thank you, thank you for having me. So I think uh, just to just to get things started, I mean. Uh, as as we do with each of our discussions, we're always fascinated by how uh, one ends up where they are. And I guess uh, Pervez and I are both interested in where your journey started. And we alluded to it a little bit in your intro. But how how did your interest in uh, uh, the, the kind of a holistic lifestyle how did that how did that begin? Well, like you said, uh, you know, I at some point in my life, I. I became very early on became interested in in medicine and health but i didn't really realize that until after i became a muslim and it was actually abu qara sufi who said to me i should do medicine and at that time i my background was totally in the fine arts and sculpture painting poetry uh, uh theater and cinema and that was my that's my profession and my studies were in that for the most part music as well And uh, when he told me that, I realized that that was something that I'd loved from childhood and was interested in from, you know, both in the body and medicine, but in the natural world, you know, plants and herbs and animals and things. So so it was something I was awakened to at that time. This was in 1969 when I became Muslim. And uh, and that from that point on, it was just like a whirlwind of excitement and interest and enthusiasm about what I was studying and working with. And that's continued up to today. And still, I find it just so, uh, so interesting to continue studying and working with people and doing my best to help them along their way and to, you know, enable some kind of healing to take place. Inshallah. Uh, there must have been, yeah, something uh, that's just, it's fascinating, all the stuff that was going on in 1969, but certainly it's, it's just uh, very interesting. I mean, the, in fact, the last person we had on the, on the show um, uh, was Dr. Hassan Bagby, and in fact, he embraced mm. Islam in 1969 as well. Oh, yes. So, right. Very, very interesting. Um, uh, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to actually, I mean, in, you know, not, not only to Zaki's point about sort of your own journey to Islam, but I, I, I'm always just fascinated by, you know, just sort of like your own, you know, like kind of where you grew up. I mean, what kind of like the family dynamic, especially as it related to like sort of religion or, 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 or and things like that. So if you can sure. maybe even, even take us back a little further, like, you know, 
That would be well, weird. I, I think it's pretty significant. And it's some things that I've come to realize a little more uh, at this point in time about my background in those early years that were significant. Probably even significant in the fact that I was so readily and easily accepted Islam. Uh, you know, I came, I grew up in Southern California, born in Denver, Colorado. But my mother was, you know, from a Kansas farming family. And my father was from New Mexico. And uh, as my father was from a, a background that apparently, we still have very little information, was his father was uh, Native American. And uh, only recently have I come to realize that he was, we, we always understood him to have been an orphan. And only recently, uh, my wife and I spent some time in the, in the Northwest Territories, you know, doing some training for trauma amongst the, the Aboriginal people there, the Inuit peoples. Uh, and their biggest trauma was the what they call the residential schools. And, you know, we're only really let go and dissolve very recently. But I've come only recently to realize that my grandfather apparently was in what they call a boarding school here in New Mexico, uh, where they were training him in how to be a white man, you could say, some of some way and and that that influence from him and my father and my father's brothers my uncles that was a very important part of my early years and my teenage years and so forth i think in forming some attitudes about the mainstream uh, the mainstream american lifestyle my, my mother like i say she's from a kansas farming family so she was you know one side of the family very uh, typically mid middle american and my father and his brothers you know very different my grandfather that i spent a lot of time with you know lived in the mountains very isolated life at the last part of his life and i used to spend time with him and so i think i got a lot from those the archuleta side of the family uh, despite the transmission and being with them and uh, uh you know year after year i learn and i see things that i discovered and learned that I didn't realize I was learning from him at that time. So I think that was an important sort of, you know, basis. And, um, you know, growing up in Southern California, it was, I call it Surfing USA. You know, I was at the beach every day and surfing, and I loved that and still do. Um, you know, that was another piece that was pretty important, uh, in, you know, in terms of learning what I feel is important for me now in the work I do, to be honest. Uh, so that's some of the background. I mean, you know, it's an interesting, this, you know, the, the cultural element there. And, uh, you know, what I find as a Muslim and amongst uh, both Muslims and Native peoples nowadays that I can understand and or I feel strongly connected to in some ways. So that's some of the background early years. Uh, but again, I, it, it, you know, I grew up, growing up in Southern California at the beach, I did not feel that I fit in well with that community uh, hmm. at all. And, and I sort of found art as my sort of refuge, wow. mm. you know, painting and then eventually sculpture and all these other things. And that was the kind of means by which I found support that I didn't, I, I guess you could say I didn't really feel as much as I would like to have had early years or teenage years. So that may have played a lot into the fact that I became Muslim, although when I became Muslim, I really feel that it came from my personal prayer to God, because uh, the truth of the matter is, I, you know, as I got more and more into my art and theater and music and so forth, I used to sing my prayers. And I, and there was a period of time for maybe a week, I was praying the same prayer, which was, you know, God, forgive me hmm. for, you know, you've been so generous. Forgive me for 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 asking but there's something more i want and i don't know what it is but please give me that thing that i long for whatever it might be wow. but i had this longing and for a week i prayed that prayer and at the end of the week i met uh abdul Qadir sufi as you say uh and he said i said i i, I hear you're interested you have a knowledge of his of sufism i'm interested in sufism and he said forget sufism this is what islam is and he just gave me the five pillars of islam and to me that was the answer to my prayer, and it took me a half hour. It was a half hour of dawah for me. And I, you know, that was it. Made my shahada at that point. So these things, I think the, the early years and the particular background I described is probably played an important part in leading up to that point. And then from then on, really, I felt like I was taken up in, you know, Allah's whirlwind, you could say. Huh. 
you know, which included this uh, new, newly found love of medicine and natural health and the natural world and so forth. So, in, in, in now, what what was the the era roughly when 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 you came to Islam? What was the era? Yeah, it was at the end. You know, I spent sixties in Berkeley, the entire sixties. So it was at the end of nineteen sixty nine. So I mean, when, uh, my my curiosity is is coming to Islam at that point. I mean, and you're you're in you're in Berkeley, which is you know kind of the heart of. Uh, you know uh, the the social uh, uh, protest movement and things like that. Uh, how 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 did you interface uh, the the p- political winds of that time with your your Islam? And did you did you was it was it an easy sort of connection to make? Well, I mean, it, the important part of that history was the theater group that was part of from uh, up the high moor. Uh, the, we call it the Floating Lotus Magic Opera Company, which was a, you know, we, again, it was a bunch of, we, a lot of interaction and co- connection with the artists of all sorts, from painters, poets, musicians, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we created that theater company and that theater group. And in that theater group, we studied and we learned about traditional models of theater from Chinese opera to Indonesian, uh, you know, puppet shows to, Tibetan dance and whatever we could find, no drama, no theater, and modern theater. You know, uh, living theater at that time was 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 kind of big, politically and street theater and so forth. So we created street theater. I don't know, maybe talk with some of the other uh, in- interviewees about it, but that was a pretty remarkable theory he had, and that's how we had to meet Abdul Qadir Sufi. Is that he because he was in theater and became had become Muslim, and he heard about us in Berkeley and came to visit us in Berkeley at that time. And that happened at that end of that week of prayer, as I put it. But so in that theater, when we were doing that theater, we were setting all sorts of things, including Sufism, hmm. you know, and traditional, uh, 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 you know, is religions of all sorts and their theaters and their stories, uh, their, you know, their cultures of these various right. things that could be used theatrically and, so in, for many of us, or for several of us, as we were studying the various you know, religions, we had a full Tibetan orchestra that was part of our theater company with Tibetan instruments and so forth. But on the other hand, we were reading Rumi and, and uh, conferences of words was kind of, kind of a required reading for all of us. So Sufism and the Masnavi, I was singing for Masnavi, Masnavi before, maybe at least a year before I became Muslim. Singing uh, my own words, the uh, you know things from Masnavi and so forth, turning them into song. Mm. So you know, so I you know that my my it, it, interesting for me anecdote I was saying is that to someone just a couple of days ago about how uh, someone was saying, well, Rumi, you know that no one's given credibility to or credence to the fact that Rumi was also a Muslim, and I and I agreed and I disagreed on the other hand because on the in the Masnavi I read the Masnavi. And to me, it became pretty clear as Muslim, and even in the Masnavi, where he refers to making the shahada as simply something you exclaim and declare. At the time, I said, well, well, how can this be that you just say something? You just yeah. speak something and become Muslim. So so I remember on this region, San Francisco, once after having read that, I thought, well, wait a minute. So if I say, and I believe it, there was no God but the God and Muhammad was a messenger of God. Peace be upon him. If I say that, and so I said it aloud with the idea, well, what am I going to feel inside? And I, I said it, and so I said, I said shahada on that count, maybe a year before I actually made shahada. Right. For, for me. So, so the, what I'm saying here is that we learned a lot about it, and so the transition was pretty natural, one, although many of our friends thought we'd gone crazy. You know, mm-hmm. that we'd gotten lost in some sort of cultish thing. Oh, you become part of a, you know, an organized religion. Although many of those people eventually became Muslim as well from that in, that group we were part of. And, and, That's and right. that th- for part of that theater company, I think there was at least six people that became Muslim following that uh, who needed. They, we lost connection with them because we became Muslim at that point. 
Yeah, and, and I mean, you, you've mentioned, um, you know, uh, Sidi Abdullah Hai Moore, um, who, you know, of course we lost uh, last year, or in 2015. Yes. So, um, you know, God bless him and rest his soul. Um, you know, uh, just, again, it's one of those things, you know, when I hear about things like that happening, I mean, one of my regrets is just not having this conversation and not really, you know, being able to, you know, I, I, I hope that, his 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 story is is preserved somewhere, you know. And uh, yes. uh, you know, I, I attended a um, we a few weeks ago. I want to say about a month ago. We we there was a remembering yes. uh, Abdul Moore event here at Talif uh, Collective here in the Bay Area. Um, yes. And you know, his wife was in attendance, and and there was a video that was shown. And um, I, I there's probably a very young. City Aki Marshaletta in one of those videos. I don't even know, but um, yeah. You know what I didn't realize was that. Uh, I think the theatrical troupe that you're talking about, um, I think there was some connection or there was some uh, relationship with people like, you know, a lot of the beatnik poets, right? People like um, Allen Ginsberg and, 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 and others. I mean, is that, do you encounter some of those figures? I mean, very notable figures as far as uh, that movement here in America uh, or, or sorry, here in the Bay, here in San Francisco when you lived here? Well, uh, Abdul Hai was, you know, he was a, a great fan of Allen Ginsberg and and and, oh, and Lawrence Ferlinghetti in San Francisco was one of his, I guess, kind of a mentor at one point in, in publishing some of his books and so forth. And we used to spend time at Ferlinghetti's house in the Bay Area, you know, that during those periods. But I myself had become involved with beat music poetry before I even met Abdul Hai in Southern California as, as a teenager because my my brother-in-law is kind of, he kind of was, along with my art as a refuge and as a support system, my brother-in-law was one of my first teachers and kind of my savior from the Southern California mainstream lifestyle, who was a poet. He was a beatnik poet. Uh, Carl Larson was his name. And, you know, I got to know a lot of, I used to go to the poetry and jazz things when I was a teenager in Southern California with the, you know, uh, poetry and jazz and all that sort of thing on a regular basis. So and became interested in poetry at that time. So, you know, later on, uh, you know, as we became the theater there, again, there were kind of artists that would stop in and spend time with the theater with the Floating Lotus Company. And, and uh, you know, so it was, it was a part of it. Some people were more connected to those, to that particular aspect than others. And then you you also I mean you, you you've you mentioned now a, a, a couple of times and I think just for the for I think a, a more full context uh, for some of our listeners um, you know Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Sufi um, and and how he kind of discovered uh, the kind of work that you guys were doing here in Berkeley um, how do you even sort of come on his radar you think I mean he's in he's in England correct at that time he was in Morocco. Actually, the story, I mean, it's quite an amazing story. It's pretty interesting because... We w I think we would love to hear about it. Well, well the interesting st part of the story uh, uh, is from Abdelkader himself. He describes this. and We had a house in Berkeley at the time we had that theater company. And that house was, you know, inhabited by all sorts of people that are artists, painters, poets, et cetera, et cetera. And we were living at that house, many of us from the opera company. And there was one man who was a sculptor who traveled to Morocco, but he was more on the sort of the Marrakesh trail, you know, at those 60s days, you know, uh, you know, more interested in the, in the cannabis that was there in Morocco than anything else. But he, Abdul Qadir Sufi had met Sheikh Habib, become Muslim, and Sheikh Habib gave Abdul Qadir Sufi 13 diwans of his poems. I don't know if you've heard this story before. Abdul Qadir Sufi's... Uh, Sheikh and who and Abu Qadir was given the the role of Muqaddam. That's right. Uh, by uh, Sheikh Habib, and he was given thirteen diwans, and he said these thirteen diwans are for my English and American murids, my students. And he didn't know Abu Qadir says he didn't know what that meant, but he went from there, and you know he went back to from Meknes where he met Sheikh Habib and making shahad and all that. And he met this man. I'm sorry, I can't remember the man's name at the moment. But he, he was traveling to Morocco in the Middle East. He wanted to visit the pyramids and all this sort of thing. And they met in a cafe, and they got a conversation. And Abdul Qadir told him about his experience with Sufism and Sheikh Habib. And this man said, well, I'm not interested 
that much, you know, but I know some people that would really be interested. And so he was referring to the uh, from the Floating Otis Opera Company. He said, if you ever go to California, go and see these people because they would really be interested in what you're saying. And he gave Abla Khadr our address in Berkeley. And Abla Khadr went back to his hotel. And as he tells it, at this hotel, there was a ticket to California from a movie company that wanted to talk to him about writing screenplay. Because he was a screenplay writer and he was in theater. Abla Khadr was as Ian Dallas. And so when he got to the hotel and found that ticket, he put the ticket together with the address in Berkeley and said, well, these two things go together. That's all the Cotter style. And <laughs> so he he went immediately to California. He forgot Hollywood. He didn't go to Hollywood at all. He went straight to Berkeley <laughs> and wow. met all of us. And then from that point, you know, we were part of that of the high Moore, myself, and uh, uh, Robert Luongo, Abdullah Luongo, who was the third person at that time. We were th three of that 13 group that went back to visit with Sheikh Habib mm. in that first uh, trip to Morocco, which is very soon after we all became Muslim. Immediately went to Morocco. Uh, now, I, I mean, a lot of what you're discussing, you know, I think takes us back to the episode with Dr. Omer and just talking about a lot of the same people that you're discussing, including um, Sheikh Muhammad ibn al Habib. Um, but also, I, I wanted, I think one of the names he mentioned was, um, oh God, what's uh, Llewellyn? Um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Do you, do you know who I'm talking about? Um, friend Both of Dr. Llewellyn? Or? Yes, 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 yes. Oh, interesting. Is, is he yeah. part of that? Is he part of that group that you're talking about? To no, go back uh, to Morocco. No, no, no. Osman mm -hmm. was no, not, not, not uh, But it's interesting because I've just reconnected with him. He's going to be part of the so Rosales. That's right. That's uh, right. His uh, name it, sort of resurfaced when I saw the lineup of yeah. people at the yeah. at the Rosales event coming up after right. Ramadan in July. Yeah. 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 So fascinating. So then you're. So then you go to Morocco um, and you meet with Sheikh Mohammed Ibn Habib. And all of his fukara and all those people from Morocco, yeah. That's right, that's right. Yeah. Um, uh, do you meet with uh, Sidi uh, Muley Hassan, who, of course... Muley Hassan I knew when he was very young. He was a teenager at that time. <laughs> right, right. And right. his father was one of my teachers. Wow, fascinating. Uh, uh, and I knew, you know, uh, 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 Osama's uh, uh, wife, she was a child at that time. Yeah. But that family, we spent time with that family in, in Fez. In the, they lived in the, you know, they still live. The family lives in the wall of Fez. In the wall of the of the souk, of the market. Yeah, that's right. Um, the Fez wall. And they've been there for something like 800 years or something. It's so you funny. Know. Again, for the sake of our listeners, I mean, you know, we uh, we, we discussed that exact house and stay in, you know, Dr. Omer again talks about visiting, you know, Muley Hassan and, and meeting with Usama, Usama's wife uh, as a young girl. So, you know, yeah. and just meeting her as a young child. So it's just fascinating. We're, we're kind of overlapping a lot of those histories. Um, you know, Zucky likes to talk about this sort of painting this tapestry, not even real, or, or not painting it, but sort of highlighting this we tapestry. Weaving a tapestry. That's right, yeah. that's right. Huh? And I think um, weaving a tapestry, but uh, we're not actually doing the weaving, Zucky. We're just yeah, highlighting we're, it. We're, we're it's, hanging it up and uh, letting people look at it. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So, um, well, well, this story, I can interrupt you. The story uh, that we're talking about here was pretty extraordinary, and I think you know, I've always felt that it, yeah. it, it it deserves documentation in some form, and I know there's been attempts at it. But you know, the truth of the matter, the thing that's significant to me is the fact that if you know, with some of the Algerian uh, students of Sheikh Habib, they say they they said you know everybody who had any connection with Sheikh Habib have five five stories to tell that are remarkable. Three, they say, and three they keep that are their own personal stories, but. Uh, the number of stories in the events, you know, from the time that we became Muslim, like I say, a whirlwind, the things that took place and under the, you know, uh, uh, with al Bukhara Sufi included, many of the things that happened were pretty remarkable things. They're like from miraculous stories and legendary stories, I think, or they could, they could be legendary, you know, that 
the things that I experienced at that time. And that was significant for many of us in terms of inspiration. You know, when you see something that's remarkable or miraculous, it could be pretty inspiring, you know, in terms of, 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 of getting you on the road and getting you moving and remarkable, you know, with real excitement and enthusiasm. Right. So, so that time is, you know, I, like I say, I, don't, I, had, I know Abdullahi was writing some things about some periods of it in some ways. Uh, Abdul Latif Whiteman wrote some things about it. There are people who have talked about uh, doing documentaries and so forth. Uh, there's that film from Norwich, which only tells one sort of small piece of it after the fact, and most in most in many ways, or a lot in in a lot of ways. So you know, there's so much more that could be told. To be honest, uh, would you think, would you just mind kind of? I, I think just sort of. I, I mean, again, without. Without doing anything a disservice, um, I think I, I would love for you to kind of, or just hear about it from you, you know, firsthand, um, because of the fact that yeah, we you know we have touched on it, um, you know, again specifically in that episode with Dr. Omer, but um, I, I would love to get your sort of point of view on it. Well, again, like I say, you know, there's there's stories. I mean, you know, there's these. I think in Morocco, a lot of the people that was Sheikh Rabi, you know, uh, that were connected with him, um, they were remarkable people. They were, you know, I mean, I would go so far as to say, you know, to say they were, they were awliya. They were remarkable people. Hmm. And remarkable things came from them, around them. And, uh, and so we kind of entered in and tasted a lot of that. Wow. Uh, you know Michael Sukic's book. Uh, the do you know that book that he's written recently? I can't remember the remember the title. Signs on the Horizon, or think or something like that. Uh, I'm heard? not familiar. No, I'm not familiar it, with. Them. Well, he talks about some of those people that we met. I mean, you know, I remember when I first went to Morocco. I could I could go on for a very long, a long time telling these stories uh, of the events that took place when I first went. When we all first went, my own experience in meeting Sheikh Abib was that I met his muqaddims one by one first. And every time, because we were in his zawiyah, his the gathering place, and he, each time one of the muqaddims would come in, I would, because I'd never met Sheikh Habib or seen a photo of him or anything, I would think, oh, this must be the Sheikh, you know, mashallah, subhanallah, and oh, this amazing man, and he'd sit and we'd have conversation. Translations, I wasn't speaking Arabic or Moroccan Arabic at all, for sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, but each one of those men, as I met them one by one, were remarkable, and I was just, uh, you know, I had already been overwhelmed from the time I became Muslim and traveled to Morocco and Morocco, that whole experience of going to such a place at that time. But uh, each one of those men I met was remarkable, and then finally, at some point, Sheikh Habib came, and when he came and he sat down, he was amongst these men that were all remarkable. I had this personal experience, which was really interesting and remarkable for me, which is I saw at that point in each one of those men, as remarkable as they were, I saw some degree of striving for something in them or some degree of defeat by something in them. And in him, and I saw that in them only because in him I saw not a trace of that whatsoever. And to me, that experience, that one moment of seeing that thing is still with me to this day. Mm. Wow. It's the kind of thing when you see something, it's like I remember one of his students in, in Algeria. He took us to a, the home of, uh, or, uh, to the maqam, to the tomb the, uh, uh, where Wally, uh, uh, they call them marabus. I don't know if you're familiar with that term, marabu. It's actually, it's, not, it's actually a stork. It's a kind of bird, but they use that term for the aulia, for the saints. Fascinating. In, yeah. in Al Algeria. So they took, Algeria, us to, right. yeah, took us to this uh, place of this marabu, this saint, and he's, his, his miracle and his claim to sainthood was one simple thing they say about him in his story. He said, they say about him that people would come to his house and he would pull back the carpet and they would have a vivid vision of the fire in the garden, as if they were seeing it for real, and then you put the carpet back, and that was it. And this, and and for them, that moment of that certainty of what they had seen was enough to transform their lives. Right. 
And so, you know, that moment, the Sheikh Habib for me was something similar like, to see that. And, then, and so they say about Sheikh Habib, they say anyone who has seen him has a, a, the possibility of arrival. And mm -hmm. anyone who has seen one who has seen him has. The, and this also is, is, is a indication of the kind of transmission that happens. It's not semantic. It's not, uh, you know, it, it's, it's something deeper and more. Um, yeah. Kind of essential, right? Right. That can take place in this, and so alhamdulillah, you know, like I say, the things that took place phenomenally in the world during those days were quite amazing. I mean, no doubt. And like no I doubt. say, you know, the people that spent time with Jacob will have these stories, right, to tell. So uh, again, for the for our listeners who aren't maybe not, aren't familiar, Sheikh Mohammed Ibn Imla Habib. Um, you said had various uh, muqaddims or uh, could you maybe d talk about what a muqaddim is and, 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 and then how, you, you know, again, you said that Abdul Qadir al-Sufi um, was, was one of those muqaddims. Yes. Yes. The muqaddim is someone who is given the authority as we might sometimes use the term deputy. So he would might be the deputies, the muqaddims would be in certain towns or villages or cities and we had muqaddams, you know, at this point, you know, muqaddams, they spread, they can spread across the world. So they have the authority to, to en enable the transmission that would come from the sheikh to a student or a would-be student. And so the deputy serves in place of the sheikh in connecting to the sheikh on some level. And they usually there would be sort of, a, a, you know, a... Uh, uh, you know, a litany of of a weird, a weird, or something that's given, uh, you know, something that's recited on a daily basis that keeps the student connected through the muqaddam and then to the sheikh. So in many cases, the student might not meet the sheikh directly, but they'd be with the muqaddam. Right. With Abdul Qadir, he was a you know legitimate muqaddam as of, of Sheikh Habib, without a doubt. That was clear. And in the early years, uh, that's all he made claim to, nothing more than that. You know, there was no name of Sheikh, and, you know, there's, you know, people have con controversial opinions about all this, well, as always with all, all these sorts of things. Um, so that's the Muqaddams, and, you know, they were remarkable. As Sheikh Habib said about the Muqaddam, he said, well, one of the things he said, the most important thing about Muqaddam is that they speak the languages of the people that they're amongst. So if they, you know, if they're from Taza in Morocco, or if they're from, you know, so you know, uh, Berkeley, that, that they'd be able to speak the language. Meaning, not just that they speak English, but they speak the language of those people. Sort of so, like the vernacular and being able to be exactly. relevant and, and and being able to be relatable. Exactly, and that's yeah. Abdul Qadir Sufi was very much that for the young, you know, uh, it's uh, aspiring, spiritually aspiring people such as ourselves. <laughs> in those days, you know, right, and uh, you know, you find that in, in, I think you find that in people like Hamza Yusuf, Sheikh Hamza, you know, that you know he speaks the language of many people, and so forth. You know, I mean, you have to be able to connect with people and communicate. So, so that's the 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 Muqadims. They were remarkable people, and many of them, you know, Allah bless them all, have passed away since that time, but. Uh, you know, I could, like I say, that that story of that particular thing that I saw personally was really important for me, um, and many other things that followed, and things that were, to be honest, seemed quite miraculous that took place during those days. You know, in the company of Abdul Qadir Sufi and with the group, you know, we we established a community in London, which was quite amazing right. for a period of time and so forth. Um, and I, I know, again, you know, uh, there was, a, I think, a segment of the community that, for whatever reasons, had, 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 as you alluded to, kind of a falling out with with the sheikh. Um, it, was that something that you come to sort of know about later, or you're, you you come to know about as it's happening? Um, I believe in I Spain specifically. Well, the Spanish, you know, the Spanish story. I'm sorry to say, I, like I. I was really not familiar with what happened, right. and really, I don't know a lot of the details. I know that there were some very things that many people found really distasteful and had a difficult time with. When I was with the group, it was in Norwich, 
I mean, sorry, it was previous to Norwich. It was in Bristol Gardens in London. And at that time, uh, Abdel Qadr was the Muqaddam. That was quite simple, quite clear. It wasn't until he went to Norwich that he, made, that he became known as Sheikh Abdel Qadr. And, was that, and that's the time that I went to Pakistan. So, uh, so I wasn't there for that particular uh, chapter, you could say. I was there during the time he was a uh, Muqaddam, all the things that happened. When he moved to Norwich, I visited Norwich a few times, and I was in Norwich when he made his statement as affirming his role as sheikh to the group there. But I missed all of the era uh, that, that happened in Spain. I was in Pakistan at the time, and I was, that's where I went to study my medicine. And uh, so I missed a lot of that. Details. I've only heard it secondhand from different people, like Dr. Omar and uh, and Fati Ben Halim was another one that was part of the that uh, that period. And I only heard it from the those two pr primarily. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I I think that we can again put a put a kind of a pin in that conversation, just because I mean, I there eventually I, I would uh, you know it'd be it'd be just fascinating. Again, for the sake of just preserving that 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 part of the history, um, to have someone you know who, as you said, kind of has like a firsthand account of what what did happen. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, God willing, inshallah, you know, we'll, we'll have Sheikh Hamzan one time uh, eventually, and I think maybe um, he'll be the person to do it. I don't know. <laughs> well, but, he uh, had a he, he had a period there, but I, you know, he Sheikh Hamza came after also the Norwich to, right the Norwich period. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Also, it comes a little later. Yeah, a little bit uh, later, and a little younger, I think, than than kind of your cadre of, of people and Dr. Omar, right? I, I remember him as a bushy-tailed, bright-eyed young teenager who was learning Urdu. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> For me, the idea that oh yeah, Hamza, this is the way this is the way you do Urdu. That concept, like, excuse me. Yeah. You know, for me, it's kind of remarkable at this point in time. To see how this happens, and I've, I mean, it's an amazing thing to see that with people too. How they, you know, they transform and move from one place. The trajectory that of people course. have in this world right. is just so remarkable and so inspiring in some cases. I mean, difficult at other times too. But you know, I could see, you know, this is one of the things that I found so inspiring for me personally in the work I do. To be honest, you know, to see people come from places where there's a lot of darkness and difficulty and struggle and you know, to see uh, how they can move from that to such expansion. Right. So, and I, I, in fact, I'd love to kind of delve right back into your trajectory then. So you said then from there, um, you moved to Pakistan to study, um, uh, I guess, prophetic healing, prophetic me medicine, Thib and Nabi, right? Well, people always say that. They, they, they say, teach us to, you know, you know, I want to, we want to learn about uh, prophetic medicine. And that's a term that's quite commonly used. And, I'm just um, translating. Right, right. I know, I know. What you're saying. But I, the reason I, I comment on it is because my my response to that is, yeah, well, you know, there is prophetic medicine. It's called Islam. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And, and, right. and, 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 and part of what I've done myself personally is to try to, to kind of glean from that the things besides, you know, the more obvious things, you know, black seed and honey and uh, I, I've tried to glean things from what I can in my my limited knowledge of Islam uh, from Quran and Hadith to glean things that are really remarkably important in terms of the principles of medicine, you could say. Because really, when I went to Pakistan and what they call prophetic medicine is often Greek medicine that people are learning and they want to learn about. You know, it's like a, it's like a woman I met and, and I and they said, "Well, I, I try." She's was a health person, and she said something like, uh, you know, I try to teach people about prophetic uh, diet. And I said, would you mean not eating at all? Is that what you, is that what you mean by prophetic uh, diet? Is just fasting most of the time and eating almost nothing? Yeah. And, and nowadays, you know, I could point to that as being this remarkable, the cutting edge of nutrition. Dramatic, yeah. remarkable, kind of total reformation and, and, uh, uh, total turning upside down of a lot of principles that are taking place right now, you know. That's right. Revo revolution in the nutritional field. 
you know, with the value of fasting just being remarkable. Yeah. You know, it just points back to that something if we'd looked closely, we would have seen all along. Do you know? Yeah, I know. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, we've talked about sort of the, yeah, we've had uh, Rehan Jalali, who's sort of a nutritionist, kind of a personal trainer. His, his background is a little different, but nonetheless, you know, just he was remarking on recent studies that just have, have, have uh, uh, validated, as you said, you know, kind of one of the things, teachings that have been a part of Muslim tradition for centuries, the idea of intermittent fasting, um, you know, yes. and frequent fasting, yes. um, and, yes. and just the virtues of that and sort of you know now the model again shifting away from what is cons- what was sort of had been accepted as almost uh, you know um well yeah what was sort of accepted as best standard practice uh which was you know to eat small but frequent meals throughout the day now people are more talking about this idea of of, of having periods or stints of fasting during yeah. during certain yes. portions of the day yeah yeah absolutely um but, so uh, so so in that prophetic so, yeah. medicine. So I went to study. What I studied was on one hand, on one hand, it was traditional Unani medicine, which the Muslims took on part and parcel, and became pretty much their medicine. And in fact, it was the Muslims who brought a great deal of that Greek medicine to the West, to Europe. You know, Ibn Sina was still Ibn Sina, the best known Hakim historically. Yeah, uh, his text of the Kanun was used in Europe longer than probably any other medical text and you know so so the you know the 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 the, that which became known as islamic medicine was really greek medicine for the most part you know transforms to a great degree or to some degree by ibn sin and his and people like him but uh but the thing i my own teacher that i met in pakistan that that convinced me that this is someone I wanted to learn from was when he told me that I learned, he said to me, I learned medicine in the forest with my grandfather. And, mm-hmm. and my grandfather said, when someone comes in, they're sincere and you want to learn that you're obliged to teach them. And that's, and I'd been looking for that. I didn't, was looking for someone who had some magic formula for this thing or for that illness or whatever, to, you know, uh, and from my teacher again, but from him, I have you know recipes that were handed down from teacher to teacher, from from Galen, from from the Greeks, you know that can ended up from you know my my teacher's grandfather and then from my teacher to myself. Wow. Uh, so you know, but that concept of learning medicine that that points to something different than just Unani medicine or prophet, it points to this principle of hikmah, mm-hmm. you know, basic principles of wisdom. That uh, uh, you know, there's a quality to all that kind of knowledge and that kind of wisdom. It's, it's more like understanding where the kind of arrangement of things in Allah's creation and the placement of things and positioning of it and so forth and the ecology of it all. You might say, and you know, it's a kind of more kind of very universal kind of understanding of things, right? Now, I know when people, you know, at least, yeah, I mean, hearing the term, you know, Unani medicine and the subcontinent, um, what you're saying is that's, it's basically elements of Greek medicine that have been appropriated by Muslims over the years, over the centuries. Well, it, I, and transmitted, I, I, and, and transmitted, of course. And transmitted, but, but, the, but you know, the hadith of the Prophet, said, in which he said the, the hikmah, the wisdom, is the lost writing beast of the mu'min. Correct. And that he has a right to it wherever he finds it. Mm-hmm. Wherever he finds it. And if you find it amongst the Greeks, the Greeks have their basic diet that the Muslims, Samawati wal art, you know, heaven and earth, That's as right. did the Chinese, you know, and then they had the in articulation of that in details with a, we could say, a tangible cosmology, which is part of, it was our tradition. Right. Earth, air, fire, and water. Jalaluddin Rumi said, I am, in, I, am in, I am inevitably bound by this this cage of earth, air, fire, and water in this world, in this, in Allah's creation. So that tangible kind of connected cosmology was part of our history, and it's no longer part of our history. So a lot of people, popularly nowadays, they want to learn that. They want to learn the mizaj, that is the the constitution and the particular balances of these elements in an individual and how that it affects the character and their personalities, et cetera, et cetera. 
But uh, nowadays in the modern world, again, what I consider important is that Hikma, what the Prophet said, that we have a right to it wherever we may find it. And to me, in that hadith, when he said, when he said, wherever, that is another way of saying everywhere. Do you see what I'm saying here? That's right. That's right. You know, it, it can be found in the things you would least expect it to be fine, providing huh. you have the, the prerequisites for seeing it. Right, right. And and I, I think it, it, another thing to me, uh, and if you could maybe just talk about it as well, is so practitioners of Unani medicine, I know, at least in the, from the subcontinent, are generally referred to with the sort of honorific or, or with the title Hakim. Um, and I think that's kind of the wisdom that you're, I think that you're referring to, correct? That is, and it's a pretentious term to use. I mean, <laughs> no, no, no. Obviously, but but yeah, exactly. I, I'm talking about that, which is a, a, it's a, it's you know it's an understanding of a certain sort. So you know that's also the reason that when people come to me and they want to know about you know uh, the more traditional Iran, you think I, I mean I learned those things from my teacher, and I learned traditional pharmacy, which is a lost art, you know, and that, and I'm sad about that. It was, it was a very elegant and beautiful sort of uh, science and art that's been lost in the world, except for places in Pakistan, India, and probably Iran at this point. Uh, but for the most part, a great deal of the world has been lost. But, uh, but along with that, what I consider really important is that in the modern world, with all that we encounter in this unique time, uh, and part of my thesis and my lectures and my, my teaching and my studies is that I personally don't believe that we've we've really appropriately recognized the impact of the modern world on the individual and the collect and and us collectively. Still, to this point, we can talk about it, we can refer to it, we can we can discuss it and write about it. But I don't think, in terms of fully understanding how deeply it affects so many things, I don't think that's been established. And as a result, the medicine that's needed and required required is not the same as the very sort of healthy my, my teacher in Pakistan he said you know using plants is the highest form of medicine you know in some ways some of his spiritual point of view stuff but nowadays we need something much deeper uh, in my own experience in my opinion you know Allah alam but I, that's my hmm. feeling so so you know as we took on unani medicine we need to take on things like somatic therapies. Yeah. We need to take on uh, uh, homeopathy as a hikmah as far as it's concerned. It's a wisdom. You know, it's a hikmah. There's a base. And if you look at the, the principles of hikmah, you will find them in homeopathy. You'll find them in somatic therapies. And, and, and what's common amongst them is they not only do not offend the principles of Allah's design, but they work with the principles of Allah's and science so that we're not causing something or making something happen. We're allowing something to take place, which is healing. Right. right. And, and, you know, and I think just, I mean, certainly here in California, I mean, it's, you always hear about sort of natural uh, or holistic medicine and, uh, you know, natural path uh, therapy and so on. Yes. Um, yes. I, I think, a, a general, I think, uh, again, as as someone who doesn't know a whole lot about it, but I mean, um, I think the premise being sort of looking at the soul, you know, the human being in in, in his or her totality. So a spiritual being, an intellectual being, you know, mental faculties, as well as the physical aspect, right? Yes, yes. Um, do you, is, that, is that an approach that... And prophetic, quote unquote, prophetic medicine also takes, I guess is what I'm asking. Well, again, you know, like I say, to me, the medicine of the Prophet was Islam. That's right. right. And if we look deeply at that, you know, it, it, the thing about it, when I became Muslim, the thing that was remarkable to me, and I say this, you know, often is, is that there was a prescription even as to how to use the toilet. <laughs> yeah. I thought, now this is a, this is comprehensive spiritual teaching. <laughs> this is a comprehensive, <laughs> you know, and not only that, politics. I mean, so all things 
aren't considered in that Islam. And, and, and the thing is, we don't necessarily look at all of it, and we choose sort of selectively to, to focus on particular things and not other things. That's, the, that's our nature as human beings, to you know, make things easier, what we can manage, you know. So, uh, you know, but even the hadith about you know, the Prophet saying, so I said, I'm saying, in the body there is an organ, and when that organ is sound, the body is sound. On one hand, that points to the centrality of the heart and the importance of the heart. But on the other hand, it so also points out the inevitable connection between the two, the wholeness of the, yeah. the heart and the body, you know, if, if we choose to look at it from that point of view, you see? That's right. That's right. And I could go on with many things. It led, again, like I said, what I've tried to do with my medicine and with natural medicine, be it homeopathy, somatic therapy, whatever I'm working with, just counseling or all the things, I try to look for the sources uh, in Islam from the Sunnah and from the Quran. And, and, and so what I really do is much more, I feel these things that I teach about medicine are really more like commentaries on those basic principles. And I try to, try to always return to those principles if possible and, 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 teach, and teach when it comes to the medicine, like the fasting and the hormonal things. All these are commentaries on things that, that uh, I, I mean, I could go on and I kind of keep on the edge of these things. I mean, recently the whole thing about the ways in which the brain detoxifies itself. What a remarkable kind of newly discovered thing that we find in the sunnah, for example, just things like that. Right, right. Um, well, I, if if I could, I mean, I, I think just just to draw a contrast, what do you what do you feel? Uh, you know, based on your own work in this area, what do you feel is lacking uh, in in the approach of of modern medicine? Like, what do you what do you think modern medicine is missing in this sense? Well, I think two things. One, you know, there's this term called simultagnosia. Do you know this term? Most I, people don't know this. I, I don't. It's one, of my, it's one of my favorite words, and nobody knows it. But it, it means the inability to see pieces as parts of a whole. Wow. Okay. Simult is simult something that happens. Simult. So, so people tend to look at, you know, it's narrow view. Mm -hmm. You know, in the Quran, it says it says in the Quran the ayahs goes something like, you know, He will purify you. Referring to the Prophet purify Tasiyat Nafs, purification of the self. He will purify you, he will teach you the ayas. And those in that by some scholars uh, commentary, that part of the that those ayas, that verse is not the ayas of Quran, but the ayas and Allah's creation in yourselves and on the horizon are ayas for those who reflect. So he will purify you, teach the ayas, the kitab, which is the Quran, the basic guidance, the basic template by which we understand things and the hikmah and so the hikmah is like you know it's a broader understanding so you know to me one of the things that's missing is this uh, you know tunnel vision way of seeing things so without including all you know one of the lectures i gave I, I titled it how all things take part in our well-being all things, and, and as a result, you know how we have to consider. So we say holistic medicine, but when we say holistic medicine, how holistic is that? How much are we taking in in terms of our capabilities and our nature? And bottom line, to me, another way of understanding is it comes back to our fitra, you know, our basic template and pattern for what we're designed to be as human beings. What is that and understanding that? And if we don't have a sense of that, how can we work towards an understanding of what health and wholeness is if we're not understanding our nature. A lion cannot be a lamb. Huh. Nor, you know what I mean? I mean, we have qualities of the lion and qualities of the lamb. That's our unique thing, the unique qualities in, in by definition of some of the Hakim's traditionally. We have all of these creatures and all of these elements and qualities compounded in us by Allah's design and we, as Quran says, and we're foolish. You know, we don't recognize... The place, you know, traditionally we were placed in a very anthropocentric, as they use that term in a kind of negative sense. Yeah, but this anthropocentrism that Allah afforded us has carries with this enormous responsibility that we're not meeting whatsoever at all. 
Hmm. So, so you know, that's one of the things that's missing in modern medicine. And the nature and the quality of Allah's design. Every living thing has certain qualities to it. If you push something and you force something, it'll push back. Even microbes, you know, have a, a, a response, a kind, of, a kind of innate, you might even call it anger on some level, you know, an innate protective quality to sustain. So if you try to force something, force it always elicits pushing back. So these basic principles mm. uh, and, and accepting the Rahma and the mercy. You know, we spend billions and billions and billions of dollars looking for an answer in an arena for cure, cures and, 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 and answers to questions and problems in a particular area that we've decided it's going to be. You know, we're not allowing that it might be someplace else completely or next to it or around the corner because Allah's Rahman is everywhere. So these are principles. My teacher said the basic principle of medicine, whether it's amongst the allopathic doctor, the surgeon, the homeopath, the naturopath, the hakim, is the recognition of the mercy and rahmah of Allah. And the man who developed homeopathy, he said, you know, blessings of God be upon him. And he may have been Muslim by that. That's another story we could go into another time. But he said, I <laughs> yeah, discovered you this. said that, I was going to ask. I mean, do, do, you have, do you believe him to be a Muslim? Right. But anyway, well, yeah. I mean, it's controversial because they found in his estate, you know, mm -hmm. after he died, they found Quran, prayer mat, tasbih. And when someone said he probably was a Muslim because he changed his name from Christian to Samuel when he moved from Austria to France. And, and all of the homeopaths, particularly the atheist homeopaths, they jumped up and said, oh, no, 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 no way. No way could he have been Muslim. God forbid. If anything, you know, that's just unthinkable. He was just too, you know, unthinkable. Well, so what, what was his name? Just again, just so that listeners can probably maybe do some Sa research Samuel on their Han own. Samuel Hahnemann. And he wrote his primary book, uh, The the Science of Home, uh, The Organon of, Organon of Medicine, in 1810 it was published. But uh, but his principles, yeah. and he was, and his medicine was founded on Arab pharmacy. That's another thing that most of the homeopaths in the mainstream don't know. That you know even that. But that's again, like I said, that's another whole story that I could go into the the hikma of homeopathy. But he said he found and discovered and developed homeopathy purely because he believed in the mercy of God. Wow, and uh, wow. and that's significant in terms of like I say. That a true medicine is that, you know, and, and we live in an age in an age in which it's, it's the control over paradigm still. There's a problem somewhere, we exert more control. We find more, you know, more more detailed or precise ways of controlling something. It's not working on, on, on an herbal level. So let's get to uh, you know something deeper. Let's get to the genetics. Let's let's manipulate the genes and so on. You know, we go, we try to control in, in so many different ways rather than allow and respect the design. That's one of the basic principles of Hikma right. to respect the design that Allah has created and to go with it. As a sort of fascinating tangent, uh, the, uh, you know, if we, if we take the first, Ella, or the, I think the first portion of the Hippocratic Oath being do no harm, then, you know, putting that in a positive, like that, that's a negative way to say essentially. The positive statement, which is "be merciful." I mean, I, I don't know. Just thinking out loud here, <laughs> but uh, but but, it, but in terms of a person practicing medicine, it becomes a primary directive to not offend. Yeah, which has been designed. <laughs> that's right, because that's yeah. then harming. Yeah, that that then is harmful. Yeah. And there are some homeopaths. Now, here's interesting: some homeopaths who say that all the illness and the chronic illnesses and diseases all come primarily from offending the design that God has created. Offending the design that God has created. That's right. That's right. So going against that fitra, as you said, that sort of our primordial nature. Going against both, both the fitra and the design of the sunnah of Allah, the pattern of Allah in his creation. Aha, aha. Right, right, right. Which is, uh, at, will be at the same time, it will also be offending our fitra because we have a place in it. Right, and our place, in it is, yeah. our place in it is as stewards for it, as protectors for it. All things in His creation. Yeah, the stone, yeah. the stone. We have an obligation to, 
to care for them. That's that's the re- huge responsibility that's been put on us in our centrality of place. As one poet said, we can we speak for the trees. We can speak for the trees, and we must speak for the trees. Right, right. Well, I mean, you know, as you said, um, Sudi Hakim. I, I mean, I think we could. Ha- you know, there's so many stories we could have you share with us and talk with us about. Um, uh, but we're, you know, we, we've we've already gone a little over an hour. But I, there's some, there's a few things that I want to touch on. At least this first first appearance of yours, uh, one of in, many. Inshallah, God first willing. of many. <laughs> yeah, yeah, one of many that that we have you on the show. Um, it, it, so then, to 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 talk about kind of the work that you're doing now. Um, but also, if you could, I think it'd be, we'd be remiss not to kind of talk about the uh, Darul Islam Center in, in, in New Mexico and, and really the, the, the remarkable work that uh, it has done in the past and continues to, um, uh, but with regards to sort of the dissemination of, of, of just Islam and, and, and you know, uh, teachings, uh, teaching Islam to, um, I think, largely Muslim and non-Muslim audiences. Yes. I, well, I think, I'm, I'm thinking in particular of like the Teachers Institute that used to do retreats there, and yes. that whole history is just so, so. I mean, again, I, I always say if there's a chapter or if there's a book written about Islam in America, I mean, to me, that's more than just a footnote. It's a, it's, a, it's an entire chapter of that book. So, well, I, I, you know, that was a really beautiful and extraordinary program, I must say. And, and, you know, the, the, the person that I would give responsibility for developing that initially was Audrey Shabazz. And I don't know if you know Audrey Shabazz. No, thank you for mentioning her name. She, oh. She's someone that's been kind of overlooked uh, recently because she's withdrawn a little bit from the, from the, uh, the Muslim kind of uh, scene. She did something years ago. She had something called AWARE, A-W-A-R-R, A-W-A-I-R, Arab World and Islamic Resources. And she was uh, you know, amazing things. She, she did really wonderful things uh, with with the uh, textbooks, uh, along with Shabir Mansuri in California, who also did a lot of work with the textbooks and the Islamic, the view of Islam, the, as we use nowadays, Islamophobia. But in those days, you know, sort of correcting a lot of things. And she developed the whole understanding that you know, Andalus- Andalusia was a wonderful model that's kind of been overlooked in, in the overshadow of, overshadowed by the Renaissance and so forth. But she did a lot of work with the teachers and teaching. And, uh, and with her, I met up with her and we did the first teacher's training program. Uh, and that was, you know, it was uh, actually, it was, in, it was funded by the National uh, uh, Endowment for the Humanities, I think it's called, uh, to some degree. And uh, But then, you know, there were difficulties and there were some problems that took place, and, uh, and she sort of dropped out of that. And I continued with it, and then I developed it with my, from my own resources and my own, you know, connection with Hamza Yusuf and Abdul Hakim Murad and Suleiman Yang sort of elicited what I thought were the people, again, back to this principle, who could speak the language right. of these teachers that we, and so what I particularly wanted were people who could be conversant uh, with the kind of teachers who were the best, because we brought to that group, we brought high school teachers uh, and, 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 you know, some junior college type, but basically that high school level history teachers was primarily the group we targeted and yeah. marketed to. And we, we enlisted the best teachers from across the country. And we, Darul Salaam at that time, we were able to get funding so that we could we could pay for two-week residential programs. Right. So what happened was, and, and, I'm, and for those who don't know, the two-week residential programs was one, we get people who are articulate and, and, and for, with these teachers could have, you know, uh, uh, real kind of intellectual discussions with them, uh, with modern references, and you know, being being on the same page, so to speak. But also, they would spend time besides having the daily lectures. They would spend time having meals with them, having hikes with them, spending time with them. And my own personal feeling that this was something that benefited not only these teachers who came, but also you know Hamza Yusuf, who had this chance to uh, Abdul Hakim, and you know these people. They had this chance to have these discussions with people outside the normal Muslim community and to have, uh, you know, interaction and to 
to, to gain from that. And I've gotten that feedback from these teachers that came. So I think it was a remarkable program. At that time, when I was at Dar al Islam, besides developing that program, I had in mind and wanted to develop the similar thing with journalists. And at that time, this was previous to 911, I thought that would have been a great program to bring journalists there uh, with residential programs with the same idea of having them not only learn normative, you know, authentic Islam, but spend time with people. So that was that program was based on a lot of these principles. This is, yeah. this is working with principles of Hikmah, to be honest. Right. You know, I mean, you know, I don't know if you know Abdullah Schleifer. No, 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 I don't. Abdullah Schleifer, well, I can't, I can't get into it. He, he, the Fall of Jerusalem was one of his books, and and one of the things he was a CBS, I think it was CBS uh, uh, person in Cairo for many years, and taught at the University of Cairo, the American University of Cairo, journalism and Al Jazeera people. A lot of those people were his students. But but one of the things he pointed out was that, you know, that reporters and people who are journalists, they could have all kinds of data and information about Palestine. But until they went and actually spent time with the Palestinians, their opinions might not change. But if yeah. they go and actually spend time with the, those human beings, those people, then they have a different view. And that was one of the principles working with them in terms of the teachers' training programs. So, you know, to, uh, to spend time with people. And, you know, it's like, she, it's like Sheikh Habib's, his, he says, don't talk to people about Islam. Don't tell people about Islam. Feed them. Mm. You know, and I could tell you stories about the, the the value of that, but but nevertheless, that's the principle. That, that so so those programs are great, and I learned a lot. We and we got we enlisted Adam Wolfer from uh, Mecca Centric to do good videos, with the idea that these would be used for non-Muslims it turned out to be for the Muslims. <laughs> Absolutely. So that that's yeah, and that it's remarkable because I was about to mention Adam and Mecca centric videos. Who that for me in my formative years in the nineties, uh, early nineties, um, those cassettes and videotapes that he was able to you know that that mean that he sold through his uh, production company were just invaluable sources of information for me. Um, and you've mentioned, you know, TJ Winter, Dr. Abdul Hakim Murad, yourself, Suleiman Niang, Sheikh Hamza, of course, but also, you know, Vincent Cornell and Sherman Jackson and, and just yes, yes. so many people who taught material and taught courses there. Um, <clears throat> so what were the what were the general years was that was that the eight was that are we talking about the 1980s were that were, were the teachers don't, don't ask me about years <laughs> anything to do with years i i i attribute that to my, to my grandfather's native blood i have a hard time with years yeah no i i can be wrong 90s yeah 90s i think yeah yeah late 80s early 90s has to be um and and to your idea about you know hosting journalists for the same purpose i mean um you know, inshallah, may that come to fruition because I think that'd be a wonderful, wonderful sort of contribution and and really building on the successes of that of of what of of what that two day or two week residency, excuse me, for the teachers did. I think. Um, but um, well, there's still you know there's still they still have I believe they're still having one teacher training. We used to do two every year. Yeah. And I left. I don't know. I can't, I can't even remember what year it was, but it's been many years, and they still have them. One a year, uh, one teacher training program still, I believe, is still happening. It might not be, but uh, yeah, Dar es Salaam is waiting for uh, new management, new people, new blood with enthusiasm. And you know, I'm really hopeful because I'm discovering more and more. You know, there are many things that I talk about that I didn't talk about and I wouldn't speak about publicly because, like, you know, eat lots of butter; it's good for you. You know that I kind of held back for years and. Now I feel a little more freedom in saying these things. Uh, but the other, you know, I was just in Maryland. You, are you from, you know, Saad, Saad Omar and, and, and the Mishka group? Of course. Yes, yeah, yes. Of course very... you know them. Uh, I was so impressed with their kind of uh, savvy, you know, and I've seen that more and more. The the younger generation of Muslims, they're, I think it's maybe it's the internet and it's just a generational thing. But uh, people are really, they're really kind of hip to a lot of new things and the cutting edge of stuff. And it's happening. Yeah, it's so exciting to see that. 
And it's inevitable. I remember seeing it back at when we did the powwows. That's another thing we didn't discuss, the powwows. Oh, I wanted to. Believe me, I've been wanting to get to it. Yeah. Uh, and, and I've been telling Zucky, there's just so much to talk about. I mean, oh. and you've talked about Saad Umar and, and yeah, and just young people. I, I was going to kind of thought that would be a good place to kind of conclude. But I think since you did bring up the powwows, and, and, and I mean, I would argue that there would be no Rehla and, and Dean Intensive had it not been for those early powwows. Yeah. Um, do mention those well, you, well, just a little a little and then we'll we'll have to kind of conclude at this point yeah well the powwows grew out of some people like including myself that had felt they had some connection with with uh, native american right. elements either in their blood or whatever i mean a lot of people have a native american blood of course it's the way these things work but uh uh you know the movement and connection and interaction of people but nevertheless, also Darlow Sam's mandate at that time was to educate on Islam, both the Muslims and the non-Muslims. And to me, part of our thing that we understood at Darlow Islam in those days was that there was a lack of a recognition of what we could consider genuine traditional Islam. There were a lot of people who were engineers uh, uh, because they're Arab. They suddenly had, you know, the 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 knowledge they needed to be uh, uh, the imam or leader of it. You know, there was a lack of traditional, real real knowledge of fiqh and uh, traditional Islam, and there was not an even understanding there was, was such a thing as what became later by a lot of the people to be called sacred wisdom, sacred knowledge, and so forth. So part of the point of the power was to gather together certain people simply so they could meet each and spend time with each other. Again, that's that principle of connecting in a way that's real and tangible in person. And uh, so it was important, you know, as we were planning those powwows. And again, Sheila Musaji, do you know Sheila Musaji? No, I, no, 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 I unfortunately. Sheila Musaji, she, she, she was part of the first powwow, just like Audrey was part of the first, you know, and then, you know, <laughs> we, we, we went on with that, but uh, she was part of that first powwow. And the goal was to, for my personal goal was to, to see that Zaid Shakar made it, that uh, 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 um, Abdul Haq uh, Godless made it, that uh, Jamil Alamin made it, that uh, you know the that the, the people who were politically active. Who who was so who was at that first powwow? You, you, you mentioned Doctor Professor Alan Godless, and then uh, Imam Zaid Shakar, Imam Jamil Alamin was there. He was at the second one. Second one. Uh, Hamza uh, Yusuf, I imagine. Hamza Yusuf was there. Uh, Noah Keller was there at the first one. Do I mean Keller was there? Wow. That's right. Okay. And so, okay. so the point was to bring all these people together and to get the political activists and the community activists at least exposed to these people that had gone somewhere. Yeah. You know what I mean? And and studied and learned, the, the you know, in a real way. I mean, it was interesting to me that Zaid Shakar, I think it was after the, the first power, or second powwow, people told me in Connecticut that he left. He, you know, it was like days later, he came back and said, I'm, going, I'm off to Syria tomorrow. We needed, you know, you're the imam. And, you know, in other words, he was a person of action. But in any case, the point was that just them to spend time and to see what the fruits of these was and to, you know, to expand the possibilities in terms of. But there's transmission that takes place when people spend time together and eat together and they sleep out in tents together and so forth. You know, the one of the things one of the things that Hamza and I used to talk to after you said I we used to talk about at the time of those powers that we've always wanted to do, and I'm gonna throw this out because someone's gonna come along and say, let's do that. And because it was Hamza, <laughs> Yusuf and I and and, and uh, uh, Abdullah Al Khadi who kind of developed the first Dean intensive. And those dean intensives had very specific parameters that we tried to follow, that we wanted to hold to, and they turned into the rehlas. But one of the things we wanted to do and weren't able to do to this day, and I still think it's true, and that would be backpacking intensive, dean intensives, where you get several people and you go into the forest or into the mountains. Because we used to do that at that time at Dar al Islam. We used to go to the, you know, we'd have backpacking trips into the mountains with teenagers. But you don't get a group of people, and you have your lessons along the way, Camping, living in nature, and, uh, and and so all of it takes place in that context. Inshallah, one of these days. Inshallah. 
Wow. Inshallah, no, I absolutely sign me up, or, or where Beautiful. can I sign up? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if I qualify as a young person, but I'd be interested in just uh, yeah being along for the ride. Yes. Um, but uh, no, th- again, thank you so much, uh, yes. Hakeem. Uh, it's been just wonderful um, to have you on, and like, and, and I, I think as I've said a few times already. Um, you know, there's just so much to talk about with you and, and we'd love to have you back on. I know it's taken us a little bit to, to schedule this first one, but you know, now that you've been on, sure. Sure. we'd love to have you on again and, 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 and hopefully in short order. Um, but perhaps before we leave, I mean, you know, as, as Zaki said at the outset, um, you know, we've got people, you know, we've got Ramadan sort of around the corner and, and, yes. and uh, a- any sort of words of wisdom that you can just impart, uh, as we do close out, uh, and, and listeners do prepare for Ramadan. Well, one of the things, you know, I, I like to point out to people about Ramadan is Allah, you know, that, Allah, that uh, in the hadith of the Prophet he said, the year is a disease and Ramadan is its cure. And and along with that, I, I will say that, you know, not eating. My grandfather used to say, the only problem with eating is it takes away your appetite. Huh. So a couple of really quick, important points. One is that we have a very basic, how much time do I have? We have oh. a very basic, very basic pattern that we have a chance to kind of erase or to rise above in Ramadan, which is I want something or I need something. This is the breast. This is one of the first things we're trained into believing and doing and establishing is finding the breast at the mother's breast. And we all know how to do it. Every mammal knows where the breast is in, huh. in, inherently, intrinsically. This is part of our fitra. I need the breast. I, I get the breast. I'm okay. I want something. I get it. Now I'm okay. Hmm. I want the breast. I get it. Now I'm okay. I want some food. I get it. Now I'm okay. I want the Mercedes. Now I get it. Now I'm okay. <laughs> so that basic infantile pattern, we have a chance to rise above. Mm. And it's something else to think about in Ramadan is the value of being hungry. Wow. Hunger and being hungry in the modern research, again, back to what you might have been talking about with uh, Ron, or the person you were referring to. Yes, uh, sir. Yes. Um, is that being hungry is like exercise. The body responds to hunger in the same way it does to exercise. Hormonally, and physically, it has the same benefits of exercise. Wow. How about that? Interesting. Yeah, yeah, very, very, so, very, very so much. So. Sort of, to sort of drink that in, so to speak. No, the, no, I mean, because I'm, like you I'm said, hungry. Oh, that's a good thing. Exactly. Because, again, we've kind of flipped it now, right? Because it's all about not being hungry or, or satiating it immediately, you know? And so that's that's the sort of modern cure as it were to yes. to never be hungry so yeah, yeah I, I agree um and and again the i think the abundance and overabundance of food and the varieties of food that we have available year round kind of speak to that which is like yes. never the the again the 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 idea being to never quote unquote deprive oneself of something so and and to take that one step further you know if you look yes. at so many things about health and well-being have to do with what we eat in the diet. In other words, right. I'm going to eat this. And, I, and, and look at the basic thing that's being taught to us in Ramadan was, how about just not eating at all? <laughs> right. right. In other words, and, and so one, one sheikh pointed out to me, he said, what an interesting part of our ibadah. ibadah. It's not something, in, in some ways you could say it's the secret of it. It's not something we do. It's something we don't do. What a deep way of expressing the inability to appropriately express our thankfulness and ibadah to Allah is by not doing something. I mean, we can't we can't do it by actions sufficiently, but we can do it to some degree by not doing something. Huh. Do you, you get my point in that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's the abstention uh, as opposed to the actual. Yeah, it's a yeah. non non action thing. A non action, an omission of an act. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. So, yeah. which says a lot. It says a lot uh, indeed. Wow. Well, I think I think that's a good place to sort of wind up this conversation with the the promise that I think it it needs to continue at some point in the future, inshallah. 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 <laughs> well, I'm happy to. 
Well, and, and, and we'd love to have you back. Uh, now, now, just based on everything you've discussed here, I'm sure our listeners will uh, be interested in, in uh, learning more about you. Are there, are there uh, any venues online uh, where people can reach out to you? Or um, Well, you know, I, I don't have a website. You know, that website was created by Adam Wolfer, so they had a, a means to distribute the videos. Uh-huh. Uh, so I don't really have a, but I do have an email. and People can contact me by email if I do my best to respond. Oh, okay. If you can but share that with the with the audience, it's it's, it's it's Hakeem Conrad H A K I M C O N R A D Hakeem Conrad at Gmail. Terrific, awesome. Well, uh, uh, Hakeem, thank you so much for for joining us. And um, uh, Pervez, do you want to close us out? Yeah. So again, uh, yeah, my, my my gratitude and thank you to um, Hakeem Marshalletta for joining us, um, and uh, thank you to the listeners for continuing to listen. Uh, if you want to reach out to us or if you want to engage us, you know where to reach us. You can email us at diffusecongruence at gmail dot com. You can also visit our Facebook page, facebook dot com slash diffusecongruence, where you can uh, leave a comment and, or send us a message. There are some messages that we were meaning to get to, and I promise. We will get to them next time. Um, but thank you for those who did reach out or do, or do reach out. Um, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, uh, wherever you can find fine podcasts such as Diffuse Congruence. Please leave us a star rating or a review. Um, every little bit helps. And thank you so much for those who have done that and, and, and continue to spread the word. So um, thank you. Thank you for listening. And uh, a special shout out to our wonderful listeners in Chicago. I, I spent some time last weekend there and, and met a handful of them. And so a little shout out to Chi Town, uh, Zucky. Chicago's uh, a, 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 good, a good place. I have, I have uh, uh, it on good authority. Good, good, people, <laughs> good people come from Chicago. I'm told. I'm yeah. told. Yeah. <laughs> so, th- uh, thank you, everyone, for listening. And uh, we will see you next time on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence. Thank you.